Thank you. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for this great workshop. It's really been super interesting to be here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a topic that I think nobody has talked about yet and that is neural networks for learning with graphs. And since this is Friday I'm going to, and it's a new topic, I'm going to keep it really, really simple. And this is joint work with a number of different collaborators because it's different papers. And this is really driven by my student Kiyolo who is listed here first. So let's start by trying to understand a little better what are the kind of learning problems we're looking at here. So why do we care about learning with graphs and networks? Um, so here's just a few examples. So for example, you may have a problem where you want to label each graph in a collection of graphs. So the graph could, for example, be a molecule where you have some information about the nodes, which are the atoms and the bonds, um, and you just want to put a label. Maybe you want to, for example, predict solubility, toxicity, or any other properties of this molecule. So at the end of the day, what you want is you want a method that takes in a graph and um, predicts a label. Another example is recommendation, where we actually want to do a prediction from node to node. So we want a representation of a node. So as a simple example here, that's an example from Pinterest. We may have users and we may have boards that, um, where users collect items. Um, so we connect two nodes. We have two types of nodes, um, items and users, and we connect those two if a user selects an item. And then basically knowing that the user selected an item, we want to propose other items to this user. And then we can have problems where we want to predict from pairs of nodes to whether, say, there is an edge or not, or what kind of type of edge this may be. Um, so we want basically representations of pairs of nodes. Um, so in this specific example, we have a network of drugs, and we want to um, predict whether if I take these two drugs together, there's actually going to be an adverse effect, whereas if I take either one of these drugs by themselves, it's actually nothing's going to happen. So that's an important problem in pharmacy. And you can add to this network nodes that are um, genes or proteins in the body. And then there's many other problems that you can actually represent as graphs that are not inherently graphs, um, but that you can represent with graphs and do learning with graphs with them. So at the end of the day, if you look at all of these problems, what we really want is we want a learning method that takes a network where we have information about nodes, possibly about edges, and gives us a representation of the network and of the nodes in the network and then we can do learning with that. And that's the typical approach that people take and it basically does both of these two things together. We have get a representation for the nodes and the entire network. So the typical st standard approach these days is to do this with a neural network. So we have our net graph, so I'm going to call this a graph, not a network for, to avoid confusions. And we send this to a neural network, the neural network gives us an embedding of this graph essentially a vector in RD. So we have been thinking about um, some properties of these networks and trying to better understand um, how they behave, what are properties of these networks. So I'm going to talk about some of these ideas here. Um, the first one we'll look at is the discriminative power of these kinds of networks. Um, basically, what graphs can they distinguish? And that, of course, is a basic for learning functions of a graph. So if the network cannot distinguish two graphs, there's no way I can learn a function that assigns different labels to these graphs. The second thing is to look a little bit more into interactions between the types of the input and the networks I would use for these inputs. Um, and that actually extends to the third topic. If I get time, I'll talk a little bit about applying graph neural networks to reasoning tasks. So, Let's start by understanding how do these graph neural networks actually work. So there's two views on them. Here's the message passing view. So what we have as an input, we have a graph. For each node, we have um, features. Basically, you can think of a feature vector for each node in the network, and we want to compute a representation of the graph. So the usual way to do this is to um, do it aggregation-based. So basically, what we do is we proceed in rounds, and in each round, each node acts as a center node and collects information from its neighbors, meaning it collects the feature vectors from its neighbors, aggregates them into a new representation, and then combines it with its own representation. And this can be done in various ways. You could, for example, average those. You could do some max pooling. You could do something else. Um, and usually combine this with some nonlinearities. And so you do this over and over again, and each round corresponds to a layer in this neural network. And then once you have done this several times, you take all the features that you have co computed for each of the nodes, 
and then you collect them and put them together into a representation of the entire graph. And again, there's different ways of doing this and different architectures differ in how they do that. Essentially, you do some kind of, you can again do an averaging, you can concatenate them, you can do something more complex. Um, and of obviously, if you think about it, so in basically round one, I'm collecting information from my neighbors. In round two, my neighbors have also collected information from their neighbors, so I'm essentially already collecting information from a two-hop neighborhood and so on and so forth. Uh, so here you just got um, basically the abstract mathematical definitions and basically different architectures differ in how they actually instantiate these aggregation and combine and readout operations. Yes? Quick question. So uh, implementation-wise, are these still implemented on TensorFlow or are you doing those GPUs? Uh? Yes, you can, like they say there's packages for implementing those, yes. And so you'll see like how it corresponds to net, you know, networks and like I'll, I'll have that in the next slide. Um, so this is basically the message passing view, but we can try to connect this a bit more closely to neural networks. So let me just unroll these operations. So here again, we have an input graph, and now I'm just looking at the target node, the yellow node, and see well, how do I actually compute the embedding of that. And here is essentially the unrolling of the operations I described. So basically the, net, the node A gets input from its three neighbors and those neighbors get input from their neighbors. And now these boxes that we have, you can think of them as mini neural networks. They are basically the aggregation operations. We apply some transformations, we aggregate those and send it to the next level. And so you see what I'm actually doing is I'm basically computing a representation of my node as a function of its neighborhood. So the neighborhood we see on the right hand side, um, it has multiplicities, the node A appears there also. Um, and what I'm using is these aggregation operations. Now in these aggregation operations, typically in each layer they are shared. So you can think of these now as layers. Basically the gray boxes are essentially the same function. So I'm having shared weights that limits um, the number of parameters I have to learn. And that, that helps, but it also puts some restrictions on what I can actually, the function classes. For example, if these are um, shared weights, basically the functions I'm learning in these gray boxes have to be invariant basically to the number of nodes I'm putting as input. So they have to basically apply to a single neighbor and to 10 neighbors or more of them. So that's a restriction. And the second thing is that as opposed to CNNs, where we have a similar kind of setup, there's no natural na ordering between the neighbors. So there's no, nothing that I know this is the upper right corner and upper left corner. So typically these also are assumed to be permutation invariant. And that's the specifics. And today we'll look a little bit more about the role that these aggregation operations actually play. So let's get back to the first question. Um, what kinds of graphs can I distinguish with these neural networks? So basically it's a question of injectivity. If I give it two different graphs, will they map into the same embedding or different embeddings? And what exactly does this depend on? Okay, so let's go back and think a little bit, how do we actually encode our graphs? So as I said, what we actually do is we get an encoding of each node and then we put them together. So really, at the end of the day, what we are doing is we are taking this graph and we are basically encoding it via a uh, collection of trees. And each of these trees is rooted at one of the nodes. And then you just, these are basically um, what you get from these neighborhood aggregations. So is this a good representation or not? And then what we're doing is we are not actually explicitly using the trees, we're kind of encoding the trees via our um, aggregations. So, is, does this help to distinguish any possible graphs? So, to make this a little bit more obvious, think about graphs like this. So, there are limitations. Um, for example, very regular graphs, this doesn't work so well. And this question is actually not a new question. So, this question is actually a question that many people in mathematics have been thinking about when looking at the graph isomorphism problem. And there's, in fact, a graph isomorphism test um, which proceeds actually very, very similar to this neighborhood aggregation, only that it's not learned. So basically what it does is um, at the so-called one-dimensional level is basically also it aggregates information from its neighbors and puts that into 
a new label for the node and you um, do this over and over again. So you can, it, for example, do this via hashing. So this test is known to work well actually for a large fraction of graphs and there's known failure cases such as regular graphs, for example. And that is our upper bound. So actually what you have is that if a GNN can distinguish two graphs, then the vice parallel element test will also be able to distinguish them. So that's the upper bound on represent, like discriminative power that you get. Okay, but that is sort of the upper bound. And now the question is, do we even achieve this upper bound? I said, basically, if you can discriminate, then the test can also do it, but will you actually ever achieve this? Or maybe not. And that basically depends on the setup of your network architecture. Um, so let's look a little bit more into what kinds of aggregation operations people have used. So here's two popular ones. So one is basically using a mean aggregation. So you apply a nonlinearity to your node representations and then you take the average or you do max pooling. So now, if you think about those, let me just give you two very simple examples where this actually fails. So here I'm giving you two nodes. Think of the colors as integers, node labels. So green is one, blue is two and red is three. And we're doing mean aggregation and we are looking at the center node, the representation of the center node. So basically you're taking an average of one and three, that's two. And you're taking an average of two ones and two threes, that's also two. So you cannot actually distinguish them. And the same thing happens for the other nodes. And likewise you can come up with other examples where mean works and max pooling fails because the fractions are different but the uh, maxes are still the same. So obviously there's, this is not as powerful as this graph isomorphism test because of the specific aggregation operations we use. And these actually are the, some that are used very frequently in practice. In the failure cases, basically, we get the same node representations. So what do we need from our aggregation operations to achieve this maximum possible power that we can get with these aggregation-based networks? And for that, um, the answer is actually fairly simple. If you think about what are these aggregation operations actually, they're basically a function that takes, into, uh, takes as input a set of node labels and outputs another label or a feature vector. So basically it's a function over multi-sets. Multi-set meaning I have a set that can have multiplicities of the items. So what I really need is a function of multi-sets that is injective. And if I have that, I'll basically encode every neighborhood into a different feature vector and then I'm good. So that's the idea behind it. And if I have this, that's a very simple condition, then I need on my aggregation operations and the combination, which is the aggregation with the center node and the aggregation of all um, node features, then I'm as powerful as this one dimensional vice Fidel Lehman test. And that's basically the thing that doesn't hold for the max and mean pooling operations because max and mean are not injective functions. So that's kind of nice because that's a very simple condition. So let's see how we could actually achieve this. Like what would this look like concretely? Um, and for that you can use another result, basically any type of multi-set function, you can encode it in the following form where you apply a nonlinear function to your items and then you sum them up and then you apply another um, nonlinear function. So of course phi has to be rich enough that this works um, but for uh, an injective function but that's basically the knobs that we have. So basically we just have, need to have this function phi to be rich enough to be encoding injective functions and then we are good. So a simple example is that we take the sum aggregation instead of mean and we use a multi-layer perceptron for the phi function. And then for the readout we can um, concatenate the node labels, for example. So that gives us one way to get injectivity, but let's look at now, so this is basically what the theory says, let's look at some empirical results and see does this even, is this even something that's relevant in practice. So basically let's now look at some, an empirical example and let's basically vary a little bit this function phi that we can have. So basically the richness of the function class of the phi's and the way we do the aggregation. So instead of sum, we may do mean or max pooling. So what do we get? So here's an example that's um, 
on a protein um, database. Um, and what you see here is the training data, so the training error or training accuracy, higher is better. So we go in epochs and the upper line that you see is basically what you can get if you do an encoding with a vice viral Lehman test. That's the maximum discriminative power you can get. So you can basically discriminate in this data set, you can discriminate everything, yes? What's the training objective? The training objective? Yeah, uh, so this was, I think, least squares error. So you're trying to predict the, the label of the query? Uh, so actually, this one is a, no wait, this is not least squares, this is just, um, it's a multi-label classification problem. So, so yeah, so every node gets uh, one out of a number of labels. So this is basically here the substructure that you have. Um, so you're basically counting the errors. So I, I mean, accuracy is like the inverse. Um, but you can do the same thing for regression problems too. So here what we see is if we use a function that's injective, so basically we use a multi-layer perceptron for this phi and use some aggregation, we basically fit the training data perfectly because we have a rich enough function class. What happens if we go weaker? So for example, if instead of the multi-layer perceptron, we essentially use one layer, we use a linear function plus a ReLU, we actually don't fit the training data as well. So we weaken our function class here and if we now also change the sum into something that's not an injective mapping like a mean or max pooling, we actually don't fit the training data very well. So these are now, of course, these are training data results. So you may wonder what about test error? Like this is just the training error and essentially all I'm saying is you can discriminate examples so you basically can fit your training data well. Um, so what we see is actually that this is the similar kinds of results are also reflected in the test error with the ex exception that this upper purple line, which is the weiss feder lehmann test, it doesn't work as well in generalization because it doesn't learn a similarity measure, it just can basically discriminate, but it's hard-coded, um, but it doesn't actually adapt to the training data. So now that we've seen the influence of these aggregation operations, let's go and look a little bit more about the network structure and how it interacts with the input data. And one thing that people have observed in graph neural networks is that deeper is not always better. Whereas if you think about images, images you could also say it's just a graph, I encode this as a grid graph, um, and you can go really, really deep and it actually, you can get really good results with that. In graph neural networks somehow this was not really the case. So there are some fundamental differences. Of course one fundamental difference is that you have the permutation invariance that you don't have in CNN. But the other one is that actually if you think about it, the image is a very regular graph structure that you input and it's always the same graph structure, a grid graph. Whereas if you look at benchmark data sets of graphs, they can be social networks, they can be proteins, the graph structures themselves are very different and they are not as uniform and regular as you would get with images. So maybe that's something that also has an influence. And to better understand this, we define what we call the influence distribution. It's basically, you look at a node X and you look at its representation and you see how much does the an representation of another node, the input representation, influence that X's representation. So you just look at the Jacobian basically of the feature of X and the input um, at Y. And then you normalize that. And what you can get basically is these visualizations that you see basically how much is this representation influenced by the neighbors. And now what is this influence distribution? What does it look like? And what you can essentially show is that if you look at the um, K-layer so-called graph convolutional neural networks that do mean aggregation, um, you are the, essentially the same as a K-step random walk. So K-step random walks means I start at the node X and I take k steps at a random walk and then I look at the probability of having reached any of the nodes. So that gives me a distribution over the neighbors. Um, and if you do a ResNet architecture, you basically get a lazy random walk. So this result uses some simplifying assumptions that have been used in the past, which means that instead of explicitly using the nonlinearities, you linearize them by doing randomization, you basically assume that with a certain probability, 
the reloos are active, and then you do expectations over that. So it's not exactly the real model, but so we were curious basically how close is it. So let's look at some examples of the simplified model, uh, basically a random walk distribution and the actual neighborhood influence. And you just look at the colors, it basically looks visually pretty much the same. So it seems despite the simplification, actually this analogy basically holds true uh, pretty much. There's like some slight differences, but it's, it looks pretty similar. So now what does, what, how does this help us? So we have now some more like functional form of understanding the influence of each of the nodes on a node's representation. Can, does this help us in any way? So one thing is that we really, really well understand the nature of random walks in graphs and how they spread in graphs. And it basically depends on the structure of the graph, the expansion properties of the graph. So here's just a visualization that you probably all know that if I start somewhere where there's basically the graph is highly expansive and I start my random walk, I basically reach a lot of nodes um, very quickly, whereas if I start somewhere where the graph is very sparse, like this tree structure out here, it takes me some time to actually reach some other nodes. So the size of the neighborhood is very, very different depending on the graph structure that I have. And now the conjecture is that maybe like different Okay, different um, depths work better for different subgraphs. So let's just look at a few examples. Let's look at examples where um, larger, basically deeper networks make wrong predictions, but shallower networks make correct predictions. And we see that on these examples where the deeper networks fail, the neighborhoods become really, really large. And here's another example where basically there's like some clustering structure and we cross across the bridge. So these are just empirical, but they kind of s seem to show that, okay, there must may be something that basically, if I have a graph that's highly connected, I may want actually a shallower network because the neighborhoods become very large. Um, and otherwise I may actually want a deeper network. So here is examples where the shallow networks fail and the deeper networks are better. And these neighborhoods are very, very tiny. So that, that's like a really, really small um, neighborhood. So the ones in the boxes are the ones that fail. So there seems to be some correlation between the size of the neighborhood and the times when the network fails. So how can we correct for that? So there's actually a simple idea. Well, make the network adjust to the um, connectivity structure of the graph. And there's several ways we could achieve this. So one is that we basically now take the more local features and the more global features, so basically lower layers and higher layers, and basically all feed them together into the last layer and let the network decide. You can do this in various ways. You can do this in a way that you basically statically once learn it for the entire data set, or you can do it that you actually learn it, to learn to adjust to single nodes and subgraphs. And those strategies are also um, reflected in the performance. So basically on data sets where you have relatively regular structures across the data set, adjusting once for the data set works. If you have more irregular graph structures, you want to be more adaptive um, to the actual instance. And in fact, the first one that I mentioned, adjusting once for the data set, is very similar to what you do in images with DenseNet. So I don't have much time for the last part, so I just briefly want to sketch the idea. So the idea is that graph neural networks are also used in other tasks where I'm essentially just reasoning over sets. So some of the examples like this are what people call reasoning tasks. So basically I get an instance, a collection of objects and I'm asking questions about relations between these objects. And this could be just What's the maximum value difference between the treasures that I'm seeing in some game? It could be something like what are the colors of the farthest objects or it could be something like computing shortest paths essentially in a strategy game. So what you really get is like you get this collection of items that you input into your neural network and the question and you want to answer this question. And now the question is how can you encode that? And there's various ways of doing that. You could just put everything into a multi-layer perceptron feedforward network. You could use permutation invariance, and there's an architecture that does that by basically applying nonlinearities to each object and then 
aggregating them in a permutation invariant manner. Or you could use a graph neural network that basically does pairwise relations in the neighborhood and then does that iteratively. And what people have observed, um, many papers have observed, is that somehow the structured networks in general perform better. So what we were trying to understand is why is this the case and is there a way to quantify what does structured network mean in relation to the task. And just very informally, here's a, an idea of how to basically quantify this. We can say like, for many of these reasoning tasks, you can essentially compute them by an algorithm. So an extreme case is the shortest pass. And now if basically the network architecture is such that I can match the architecture, by looking at each of these gray boxes, my mini MLPs, and matching them to basically modules of this algorithm, and each of these boxes can be very simple, then I can learn it easily. So here's basically an example of the shortest paths algorithm um, that you, the algorithm basically goes over the nodes and it does something for each node, which is just a pairwise operation on its neighbors. And graph neural network basically does exactly the same. And now there's actually a way we can make this more quantifiable and we see this also reflected in experiments. So basically the graph neural networks very much align with this versus the others, basically the anti-algorithm you have to encode in one box instead of just encoding that single pairwise operation which is just a plus and a min. So you have to learn actually much more, a much more complex function. Um, so I'm out of time, so I'm just gonna claim that you can see this in the results. Um, you can basically see this reflected that GNNs that have a sufficient depth actually work um, and they can basically align with the best algorithm you could get for this problem. You can make this theoretical also and actually quantify this um, and that gives a partial explanation I would say of why structured networks actually work better for some of these tasks. So with that let me just conclude. I showed you a few um, questions about exploring the properties of graph neural networks, relating them basically to graph isomorphism tests, looking at their discriminative power, looking at the relation between depth and network structure, and getting more into understanding why structured networks work better for some tasks um, versus some other networks. Thanks. <laughs>